And so this, so, so what we're talking about in 2019 is we, the first sermon of 2019 is this, is, um, and I actually got the little bulletin here. I got to say it because this is the title, which is really interesting. It is Finding Space for What Matters Most. Now, you would think that'd be a sermon that we would give in, two, you know, like 2018, the last one, but we decided we wanted to save that for today and launch it today because it's really important that you need to find out here in 2019 of what matters most to you. And so the core idea, which is not going to be on the screen, but if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. The core idea is this, is to create margin. Create margin. And we know what that means. It just means creating space. We use it in, in, in financial terms. Hey, you want to create margin in your budget so that you're not stressed out because if you have less margin, you're going to be stressed out. And you're going to be like, oh, can I pay these bills? Like, can I do these things? You want to create margin. You want to create space because when you do that, you actually, there's more peace. You're more focused. And we actually create space and margin relationally. You know, if you're married and you have kids, man, Creating margin would be like doing a date night. Date nights are important, right? But here's what I thought was interesting. I remember when Stephanie and I, Stephanie and I have been together for 10 years now, married for 10 years. We got three kids, you know, the uh, twin eight-year-old boys and a four-year-old daughter. And I remember before we had kids and we were just dating, we had date nights all the time. All the time. And it's funny to, like, run into people or talk to people that are dating now and they're, they're just dating, having fun. And, and they're like, yeah, you know, we really need a date night. I'm like, you're dating. Every night's a date night. Like, there's nothing unique about what you're doing. You're always dating. But then when you get married, and, and, and something is different when you get married. Life gets really busy, and you miss the person that, you're, that, you, that you married. You're like, oh, I haven't spent time with you. So what we try to do is create margin. Especially when you have kids, you got to create that space. You got to create that margin. And so, what Stephanie and I do, we try to do date nights because we need to spend time with each other. We need to remind ourselves that we love each other. We need to remind ourselves that, hey, we have a life outside of these kids. And we don't get to go out all the time because going out's expensive. So, what we try to do, we try to get the kids to bed early. And if you're a parent, every parent has a technique of getting their kids to bed early, but they never want to share what that technique is. For real, parents, all parents have this like thing that we won't post on Instagram on how we get our kids to bed early. We just do. And so Stephanie and I, we get our kids to bed early, and then we have our time. We talk, we, we, we actually talk about what's going on in each other's hearts, we get to have conversation, we get to watch shows that we want to watch, instead of spirit riding free and all the shows that Madeline wants to watch. Like we get to actually hang out. And what, that, what, what happens there is that our relationship gets stronger and the kids benefit from it. The kids are to see, man, mom and dad love each other. Mom and dad know it's like they, they want, they need each other. They need to be with each other and they strengthen each other. That's because mom and dad create margin to spend time with each other. And so you understand because you do this with your friends that you love. You do this with people that you want to spend time with. You create margin for people that you want to spend time with because you know they're important. And so in 2019, we want you to create margin and spending time with Jesus. We want you to create that margin time where you spend time with Jesus. You create margin, create space to spend time with Jesus and do everything you can to say, I'm going to make time with Jesus a priority. But the tension, the tension that we're going to face is that if we get close to Jesus, we're afraid of what he's going to tell us. The tension is if I create this space and this margin with Jesus, he's going to point out things in me that I don't really want to hear. And that brings a lot of tension. That's sometimes why, this is what people do. They try to stay away. And we're actually going to look at a story in the book of Luke. And Luke was a guy who was friends of the disciples, Jesus' friends. And he wrote a biological, chronological story of Jesus. And he talks about these two ladies, that if you've been a part of the church world, you, you know these two ladies, Martha and Mary. And we're going to look at how Mary created margin, created space to be in front of Jesus and allow Jesus to change her, while Martha, you know what? She was like, mm, I don't know if I want to get too close. 
and we're going to look at their story. Now, you can see their story in Luke chapter 10. And, and in Luke chapter 10, verse 39, I mean 38, it talks about Jesus coming into Jerusalem, okay, and, and to an outside city where he stays with Martha, and it says that Martha is hosting. Martha brings in Jesus and the 12 disciples. Jesus' entourage is all there. You know, a bunch of 12 dudes that look homeless, right, walk in with Jesus. And she's hosting them all. She's, she, she gets all the food ready. And then verse 39, in verse 39, it says something really interesting. It says that Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. Interesting contrast. That Mary, instead of hosting, she says that she went and sat at the feet of Jesus and wanting to learn. See, Mary created margin, and we're going to see that Martha didn't. And that Martha did something called margin killers. We're going to talk about these margin killers. We're going to see them as, as, as we look at the story. And we look at what Martha did to kill margins. And margin killers are just, you know what? You, you, you destroy that space that you want to have so that you could spend with the person that, you, that matters most to you. So the first point that you want to write down is this. One of the margin killers that we have is that Martha was trying to do too much. Martha was trying to do too much. And oftentimes we get caught in this, in the busyness of life, and we try to do too much. We create a task list, a task list of things to do. And actually, Luke talks about it in Luke 10.40. Watch this, in Luke 10.40. Look at this verse. This is really interesting. <clears throat> Can you put that up? Awesome. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. Interesting that Luke wrote this. And Luke put the word but here. And if you see that in your Bible, circle it. If you have a note, circle it. Because it's interesting, he's contrasting something. He's contrasting Mary in verse 39 who sat at the feet of Jesus. And he's saying, look, she created margin. She created space to sit with Jesus. But Martha, on the other hand, she was distracted by her many tasks. Now, this word distract is really interesting. If you look it up, it's, it talks about pulling in. It talks about how you're pulling things in towards you. And what Martha was pulling in towards her was all these, all these choices, all these things that she had to do to, to not create that space for Jesus. Because here's the thing. When you pull too many things in close to you, you end up creating a wall. And that wall ends up cluttering you, ends up stressing you out. You can't see clearly, and that's what she did. Whereas Mary, she did something different. She simplified, and that's our next thing. See, when you start to, to do much, to, when you start to do too much, and, and you start getting stressed out, the thing is to simplify. Simplify. Just choose what's important, and that's the hardest thing to do at times. Because you think everything's important, you think everything's necessary, and Martha's like, uh, you know, I got to do all these things, and 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 I got I got I got to cook for twelve for fifteen some odd people. Got to, all these twelve dudes who are hungry, and she's stressing out. But, Mar but Mary's like, no, no, I, I, we'll get to that later. Right now, I need to focus on Jesus. She saw what was important. And when you begin to simplify, man, it narrows down your focus. But Martha was stressing out. And I'd like to believe that Martha wanted to get distracted. She wanted to pull things in because she didn't want to get too close to Jesus. Because if you got too close to Jesus, the things he would say to her would bother her. And I feel that for some of you, it's the same thing. Like, if I, get this, if I just stay distracted, Jesus won't pinpoint the things in me that need to change. If I just stay distracted, I won't have to focus on what Jesus is telling me. And that's what Martha kept doing. She kept running back to the kitchen. She's like, oh, my gosh, we don't have enough hummus. Let me get back in there. You know, let me get some hummus. We don't have enough pita bread. I get that pita bread. I get that warm pita bread ready. Now, if anybody here has ever had warm pita bread, it's amazing. If you never had warm pita bread, go to Publix afterwards and get yourself some pita bread. Take it to your microwave. Put it in for 10 seconds. All you need. Still, you see it rise, pull it out, and eat it. It's amazing. But this is what Martha was doing. She's like, I got to get all these things ready. She just didn't want to have to engage with Jesus because when you get close to Jesus, when you, listen, when you create that margin, he's going to speak into your life, and he's going to change you. 
But what ends up happening is when you have, well, listen, when, when you're trying to do too much and you don't create that margin, you get frustrated. You're like, look at all that I'm doing. And then you end up doing the next margin killer, which is this, is comparing ourselves to others. You start comparing everything, everything that everybody else has and the opportunities everybody else has, and you forget the opportunities God has given you. You forget the things that God has given you and the things that you ought to be grateful for, but then you just keep looking at everybody else, and your story always stinks. And we actually see it here in Luke 10.40. In Luke 10.40, the second part of it is this. This is really interesting. This is, this, this is Martha. This is Martha saying this to Jesus, Lord, don't you care? Look at that mother guilt she threw out at him. This is like insane mother guilt. Don't you care about me? That my sister has left me to serve alone? And now when you read this, we think that she did this like little technique that we teach kids. Like I teach my boys like, hey, Gabriel and Isaiah, if I'm talking to somebody, come up and you just put your hand on my shoulder, your hand on my arm, and then I'll know when I'm done here, I'll talk to you. Like we think that, you know, Martha came up to Jesus and gently put her hand on his arm, and he says, oh, hey, Martha, excuse me, everybody, let me talk to Martha for a second. Hey, Martha, yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. Martha just came right in. She's like, you know, coming in. Hey, Peter, did you wash your feet? No? Nah? All right, thanks, man, whatever. You know, here's some, here's some falafel. All right, hey, Jesus, can we talk for a minute? What is she doing? Because I'm working hard. I, got, I still got chickens to pluck and things to cook and things to do back here. What is she doing? This isn't fair. This isn't right. And what Martha's projecting on Jesus is her, 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 her comparison of like, Jesus, why does she get to do that and I don't? This is your fault, Jesus. Don't you care about me? And here's what ends up happening. See, when you don't create enough margin in your life, you get stressed out. And then you begin to point fingers. And when things don't work your way, guess who you blame? You blame Jesus. You blame God. And you're like, here, God, here's my agenda, God. I got things to do. Take my agenda. Do something about it. Don't you care about me? And God looks at you when you spend margin, when you create margin, he's going to tell you something really interesting. He's like, hey, I don't want your agenda. I want your life. I just want you. I don't want your agenda. I want you. And then when we force God out of the picture, and we, don't, and when we give him slivers of our time, suddenly we, we become complacent. And look, at, look at what everybody else has, and we say, God, why didn't, you give me, why didn't you give me those things? But because we've created so many tasks, because we got so distracted, we can't see the things that God has given us. We can't be grateful. That's why it's important that when you begin to start comparing, you need to create margin. One of the ways to do that is this, is to reflect on who God is has made you to be and do. Reflect on who God has made you to be and do. Because God has given you things. God has blessed you with things. God wants to do things in your life. He's made you a particular way. And he wants to speak to us in that margin time. Now, some of you are like, what do you mean by creating margin with Jesus? Well, it's spending time with him and say, okay, I'm going to spend X amount of time with Jesus. What does that look like? That means you, you get a Bible and you open it and you read it. And you, and you start talking to Jesus, but you're like, but Jesus isn't in front of me. He isn't here. Well, you start talking to him. You start asking him questions. You start reading, and, and you start engaging with what you're reading. And then you, and then you take time to pray and have conversations with Jesus. You create that margin. Now, for some of you, the morning time just isn't good. I, I understand that. Morning for some of you is like that, you know, you're like, well, look, I can't function in the morning, Right? Okay, well, you got the rest of the whole day to figure out when to have that margin time with Jesus, of creating that time, because he wants to say things to you that's unique just for you. See, coming to church is, is a hassle sometimes. It's tough, especially when you don't create margin for it. I mean, you already have things coming against you. Like, the devil doesn't want you to experience Jesus. But when you don't create margin for coming to Sunday, Man, things get stressful. And, I, and it's interesting that this morning I was talking, you know, to our Sunday morning audience, our Sunday morning crowd. 
And when you don't make margin to come on Sunday morning, you get stressed out. And for parents, you know, you understand this. You wake up, oh my gosh, we got to make it to the 930 service. We got to make it. Okay, okay, get dressed. I got to get dressed. Kids get dressed. And you finally get everybody in the car. You turn around, you look back. Where are your shoes? Why don't you have shoes? And then you feed the kids breakfast. You know what you do to feed the kids breakfast? You give them a box of Cheerios, like eat this, figure it out. Let's go. Traffic is crazy. So you pull into the parking lot. You got our wonderful parking team saying, hey, come on in over here. You're like, I ain't listening to you. I got to park over there earlier. And you just buzz by. And you come in. We got to go to church. You know, we got to go to church. We got to worship God. Get in here. You know, you get them into the children's ministry. And you come and you sit down. I'm worshiping God. And the whole time you're looking at other people. You're like, how come that family is happy? <laughs> How did that family look excited to come to church? Like, what is up with that family? Did they smoke? Did they hot box their car before they came to church? And I know it wasn't medicinal. Like, what did they do to get all their kids happy, to get everybody excited? Why can't I be more like them? Why can't, why, 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 why? It's because you didn't create margin. And guess what? Sunday comes every seven days. And when you create that margin, God's like, hey, I got something prepared for you on Sunday. I want you to come here, and I want you to experience my power. I want you to experience my grace. I want you to experience my love. I want you to see that the parking lot team is here to serve you, that you don't have to think about where to park. They're going to lead you towards a place to park, that you're going to have people here who care about you. And you don't have to compare yourself to the other family and to the other people, because look at all the things I've given you. And when you begin to create that space and when you begin to start creating that margin where you could reflect on who God made you to be, and the things that God has in store for you, it prevents you from doing the next margin killer, which is criticizing people. Because when you compare and you talk about what you don't have, you begin to blame God and you begin to look at others and criticize them. And you want to correct everybody for what, all the things that they do because no one ever does things just like the way you want it. No one ever does things the way you want them to have it done. And you begin to criticize her. Look what Martha did in Luke 10, 40. Look what she did. This is how she criticized. She said, so tell her, tell Mary. And she did it. You know, if you ever want to get embarrassed, have your sibling tell you to do something in public. Right? And if you have siblings here, you know they have no problem embarrassing you. Siblings love it. They have, they, it's like they get, they get a sinister thrill of embarrassing you in public. And this is what Martha did. Jesus, tell her to give me a hand. Tell her she needs to help me. That person isn't serving me. That, that guy didn't give me the promotion. You know, these things, and you start criticizing people because, you know what, it's their fault. It's the company's fault. It's this fault. It's my husband's fault. It's my wife's fault. It's my kid's fault. Every, it's everybody's fault but your own. And when you criticize, you just have bullets in your gun looking for people to shoot to blame for why things haven't been going on well in your life. When the whole time you never created that margin that God has asked you to create, to discover who he tells you you are, to discover, you know what, that he wants to correct you, he wants to mold you, he wants to change you. And it's in that margin time that he speaks into your life. It's in that margin time where you could do this to increase your margin, which is this, is ask God to change you. And it's in that margin time where you ask God, God, please change me. I don't want to be this person. I don't want to walk around and have and be that critical person that everybody looks at, that everybody walks on eggshells on, that when I walk into a room, suddenly it's like the lights turn on and roaches just scatter. I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be this critical mind that, you know, is always criticizing people, see the best, the bad in people, the worst in people. I don't want to be that. God, change me. And you know when God changes you the most? It's in the margin. It's when you're alone. It's when you're taking a walk and you're talking to him. And he speaks gently to you. It's like what it says in Hebrews 12, that taking the correction from God. The author of Hebrew writes something really interesting. In Hebrews 12, he says, when you take correction of God, when you let him correct you, when you let him mold you, that's, that's where you're going to develop righteousness. That's where you're going to develop how to think the things that God wants you to think and do the things God wants you to do. And there's going to be a reward for you because you're allowing God to mold you. And it's in those margins when you ask God, 
hey, please change me. Because if you stay critical, if you stay critical, and you don't change, you do another margin killer, which is this. You treat everything like a crisis. You treat everything like it's a crisis. Do you know those people? You know those people, right? You're driving with them. They snap at you. You're going five over. Slow down. Like, whoa. Wear your seatbelt back there. Change the music. It stinks. This music's too loud. There's problems everywhere. You didn't send the right memo. The paper clip is off. Did you turn down the AC? That's a huge one, right? And the person that treats everything like a crisis, man, they're like a walking time bomb. And for some of you, you know that in your 2018, see, you know if you spent time and created margin for God in 2018, you either know it or you don't. It's a yes or no question. Because there's always, because see, if you answer yes, you don't feel guilty. You say, yeah, I spent, I created margin for Jesus, and I'm hoping that in 2019, I get to create more margin for Jesus, and I create more time, because you just developed the desire to spend time with him. But if the answer is no, you know it's a no. Because you look back at your life, and you're like, man, I blew up in a lot of things. I didn't have peace. When that person broke up with me, when that person swiped left, hope you're not on Tinder, Right? When things happened, when somebody at work didn't do what they needed you to do, like when things happened, you over-exaggerated, you blew up, you had no peace. You didn't have the peace of God in your life. The joy that he gives you when you spend time in the margins, when you create that space for him. Look here at how God, how Jesus corrects Martha in Luke 10, 41 and 42. I love this. <clears throat> In Luke 10, 41 and 42, he says this. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, honey, sweetheart, Martha. See, Jesus, see, Martha put Jesus on blast by critique. It's like, you didn't do this. You didn't do that. You know, why? You know, you don't you take care of me. Don't you care about me? Get me? And so, and she did it in a, probably a rude way. But Jesus was so gentle with her. Jesus created a margin space. And sometimes Jesus will create margin in your life when you don't want to create it for him. He loves you so much that he'll create some time. And this was that margin time. And it comes in correction. It comes when he's giving you some critique. It comes when he's trying to help you. Martha, you were worried and upset about many things. And this, this is when he touched a sore spot. Because it wasn't just about what was happening in the house. Jesus is like, Martha, you've been worried about that thing with your job. Martha, you've been worried about that thing with your neighbor. Martha, you just really, you've been worried about a lot of things, and you just haven't been spending time with me. You haven't, you haven't, you haven't slowed down to reflect and see that God is good. Martha, you've been worried and upset about so many things, and it's stressing you out. You're making a crisis out of this whole issue. I, I just want you. Then he, then he, what well, he contrasts worry and upset to what is necessary to finding out what matters most for the one thing that can make margin. Then he says, Mary has made the right choice and it will not be taken away from her. Mary made the right decision. And when you start creating a crisis out of everything, if you want to create more margin in your life, here's what you do. You don't panic, you pray. And I'd like to believe, because this is now the story is over, and then you could go into Luke 12, I mean Luke 11. But I like to believe that Mary, Martha was like, okay, Jesus. So she walks back into the kitchen, and she's like, ah, you know, this, this guy, you know, he's healing everybody. He could heal that guy from blindness, but he can't get my sister to come help, right? You know, what's going on? Here's all, oh, I'm going to get this baklava ready. got to get the falafel ready. There's so much. And then, you know, she's like, wait a minute. God is a God of peace. He's a God of shalom. Let me slow down. I'm, I'm just losing my cool. So God, what, what do you want to do right now in me? I'd like to believe that she heard a voice, a sweet whisper say, hey, come hear me talk. Come listen to me. I'd like to believe that she walked out of the door. She found a spot 
and just fixed her eyes on Jesus. She just focused on him. And I'd like to believe that she learned something in that moment. There's a, a cool, uh, one of the ways you want to create margins by reading your Bible. And, and some of you, you don't remember what a book looks like, but that's okay. <laughs> what a book feels like. Um, but there is, um, there's Bible app, an app that you could just read the Bible on your phone, which is great. And I want to read to you something in Hebrews 4.16, okay? Now, in Hebrews 4, the author says some stuff about Jesus. So we're going to start at verse 14. And I want to read this to you. It goes like this. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us firmly, let us hold firmly to what we believe. That we believe that, this, that Jesus is the Son of God. That Jesus is building this bridge between us and God. That he's making this connection between us and God. And that we can have access to God at any time. There's no tolls. There's no interruption from boats coming through. Like you have immediate access to God. Verse 15. This high priest of ours understands our weakness. For he faced all the same testings we do. Yet he did not sin. Yet he did not sin. See, I, I like to believe that Mary understood something. That Mary probably has had some conversations with Jesus where Jesus addressed stuff about her past, stuff about her frustration, stuff about her worry. And she's had these little conversations with Jesus that made her feel so comfortable to come and sit at his feet as a woman. Let me explain something. Women back in those days did not get taught the Torah unless they, the, the, which is the word of God. They didn't get taught things unless they knew a connection, unless they were, they were some kind of special person to be taught it. And here Jesus is revolutionizing the game by teaching her by speaking to her, by connecting with her. And I just like to believe that she felt so comfortable understanding that Jesus understood her past, understood her problems, connected with her. It's almost like every time Jesus spoke, she felt her soul come alive. So Mary created that margin, that space. And then I love what verse 16 says here in Hebrews 4. So let us, it's an invitation, so let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. Then we will receive his mercy and we will find grace. We will find grace to help us when we need it most. I like to believe that Mary, man, she found, she, she, she just had this connection. She had a friendship with Jesus. So she went up there and she's like, you know what? I'm going to sit down with Jesus. I'm going to create margin. I'm going to let him speak into my life. I'm going to let him encourage me. And she just got right down to that level and just soaked it all in. She's like, I, I know, you know, I made mistakes yesterday. I, I did things I shouldn't have done yesterday. But I feel like God has something in store for me in the future. And I like to believe, I like to believe that in these moments that you spend time in the margin, God gives you grace to help you when you need it most. I like to believe that Mary became a leader in the early church, that Mary took the words of Jesus so seriously, and it happened because she spent time with Jesus in the margins. And then when Jesus resurrected, guess what Mary did continuously? She spent time with Jesus in the margins. She spent time with him. I like to believe that she, she, she would walk around lakes and talk to him, that she would let God still speak to her because she remembers the day that he came to her house and she sat at his feet, and her soul was never the same. So our encouragement to you is, are you willing to create margin for Jesus in 2019? To let him speak into your life, to let him, to let him correct you, to let him mold you, to let him guide you, to let him tell you that, hey, I got a future, I got a hope, I got a dream for you. We have a slogan here at church called, be the church. We tell this all the time. I want you to be the church, I want to be the church, I want you to be the church. And by being the church, it starts when you create margin. 
Because when you create margin, you begin to learn what God says about you. And so in the moment, the band's going to come up, and we're going to give everybody some margin time. But i got to tell you something. This encore service started because some of you have decided to have margin time with Jesus and to dream big. Some of you said, you know what, I'm going to dream, I'm going to talk to God in the margin time. And you had no idea back in 2018, in January 2018, that we would be here. That we would have this open. That people would come. That we would have a leadership team. But you know what, it was the time in the margin that Jesus spoke into you and said, hey, I want you to be a part of something bigger than yourself. Hey, I, I got something in store for you. Hey, I want you to change this because if you change about this about who you are now and you allow me to change this about who you are now, in, in the near future, it's coming. I got something in store for you. I got things I want you to accomplish. I got people I want you to affect. I got people I want you to speak life into. I want to empower you, and it all starts in the margin. I just want to say thank you to our church leadership for spending time in the margin with Jesus. I want to say thank you to our young adult team for spending time in the margin. Because when we spend time in the margin, God does exceedingly more, abundantly more, than we could ever hope, dream, or imagine. And I think this service is it. And there's so much more to come. And so what we mean by be the church, you can find that in Matthew 22. And in Matthew 22... 37 and 39, it says this, and Jesus was being asked a question by a religious leader. The guy was like, teacher, which is Jesus, which command is the, in the law is the greatest? So Jesus said to him, I know you guys got like 600 some odd laws. I mean, let me narrow that down. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important commandment. The second is just like it. The second is just love your neighbor as yourself. Huh. See, something happens when you spend time in the margin. You get to understand what it means to love God. And in the margin, you love God with all your mind. You get to think about the things that he's done for you. Think, of, think about his goodness. Think about his grace. You just think about the magnitude of who God is and the impact he's had in your life. And then you get to reflect and dream about, man, look at where we were last year. Look at where we are now. Look at the person I was last year. Look at the person I am now. And it's by your grace. It's by the spending time in the margins. It's by approaching your throne and receiving what you've given me. It's by spending that time in the margin that I discovered who you are, Jesus, and how you changed me. It's changed the way I thought. It's interesting because it says, hey, love the soul, with, love the Lord your God with all your soul, with all your heart, with all your mind. And then this is the greatest commandment, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. Some of you in 2018 have not loved yourself. And you got so busy at doing things for God. You got so busy at doing things and keeping yourself busy that God wanted to talk about you. And it's in the margin where God says, hey, I love you. You're important to me. Hey, I want you to see yourself the way I see you. I believe in you. I love you. I, 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 I desire good things for you. I want to give you power. I want to give you strength. And I believe that you're qualified with my power inside of you. Like, yo, we got this. Do you see it? Do you see it? And then when you spend that time in the margin, you realize, what? God, you love me that much? Even when I did that, yes. Even when I'm, I'm, I'm going to mess up later, yes. Oh, by the way, you, you know the way that you are? You know the way that you're wired? You know the way that you're gifted? You know, this unique way that I made you? Guess what? I want you to love other people like that. And this church, be the church, our motto, be the church is to love God and love people. And it was so interesting to just to say something this, this morning. You know, when I started two years ago at the 11 o'clock service, I was preaching to an audience about kind of this big, just maybe a little bit more. Two years later, because we've had people here who create margin time with Jesus, who are devoted to loving him and to loving others, this morning at 11 o'clock, we saw 223 people two years span 
And now, a year later, our young adult ministry started at a house. And within, and, 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 and within a year's time, you guys are leading, creating this atmosphere. So people in this area, from all ages, from all walks of life, from all experiences, gets to come here and experience what it's like to put, to create a little margin for Jesus and what Jesus could do in their lives and how Jesus could, ex, could, could change them if they just give them some margin, some space to speak into their lives and change powerful stuff 89 that was it 80 80 thousand 89 thousand people in this area within a five mile drive in any direction how many of those aren't experiencing God don't make time for him in the margin and what could God do in their lives with some time in the margin with an hour on Sunday night with some time in a small group with 15 minutes a day with a half hour a day an hour a day with just margin time with Jesus everything begins to change so we want to give you some margin time the band's going to play a song and this is your chance and you have the entire area because sometimes listen you just need to be alone like you're probably here with somebody's like I love you like we're friends but I need me and my Jesus time and let Jesus speak to you. Let Jesus be the, let this to be, let, it out, let this be your margin time with him. What does he want to tell you? How does he want to encourage you? What do you want to ask him? What do you want to thank him for? What are you concerned about? Talk to him about it. This is that time. And if you don't know what to say, allow the worship and allow these words of this song speak to you. And allow this moment to be your margin time where Jesus could speak into your life and allow him to encourage you, to empower you, to correct you, to restore you, to mold you, to envision you to be the church. Surely your love, 
your mercy, your peace, and your kindness will follow me. Jesus, I just pray that we all in 2019 make a decision, a conscious decision, and we are just motivated and inspired to create margin with you to spend time in that space with you where we get to t hear from you. Oh, man, your love and mercy, it follows me. Amen. That wherever you go, I will follow. That you encourage me to be the church. That you love me. Thank you, Jesus, for this service, for the lives that will change, for the people that will come here and have a little bit of margin time with you in their week. And that that margin time on Sunday evening will change their eternity. And we'll have a group of people, a multitude of people, desiring to be the church because of the margin time they spend with you. We love you, Jesus. Amen.